And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Translators on Air. My name is Dmitry Kornyukhov. I'm your host. Uh, Join me today, my incredible co-host, Elena Tereshenkova. Hi, Elena. Hey, guys. And our guest, Vova Zaharov. Hi, Vova. Hey, everyone. Hi, Dmitry. Hi, Elena. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Vova. Uh, you might know Vova as a translator and the community manager at Smartcat, uh, but he's also running a one-person agency uh, with almost 30% of his translation income coming from managing his clients, uh, client projects and in language pairs other than his own. Uh, Vova is a perfect, uh, in perfect position to tell us a few words about how translators can transition from running their own agency business. And this is going to be the topic of our conversation today, we'll be, we'll be talking about running one person agency. But before we jump to the topic of our conversation, I would like to make a few announcements as always. Uh, the fourth season of Translators on Air has been sponsored by our friends at Smercat. Uh, Smercat uh, allows you to connect and collaborate with new clients. Uh, you can find more jobs on Smercat platform and you can also use their free cat tool. Uh, so if this is something you're interested in, check out Smercat by clicking the green button below this video or by visiting the first link in the description if you're watching this in the recording. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. We have quite a few people joining us today. Hello, Becky. Hello, Sylvia, Maria, uh, Una, Khaled, uh, David, Panas, Andrea, Octavia, Andre, Faustina, Peter, Jakub, Maria, Alice, Virginia, Slava, Anna, Iger, Saul, Lisa, uh, Silvia, Andre, Gautina, Luis, Isabel, Francisco, and Jurandi. Okay, I, I hope I didn't butcher any of your names, guys. If I did, I apologize. Uh, I can see quite a few new faces here. So uh, let me quickly uh, introduce you to this platform. Uh, this is a live webinar. Everything is happening in real time. You can actively participate in this webinar. You can ask questions. Uh, you can use the chat window on the right-hand side uh, to say hi and hello. Or you can post your questions in the dedicated Ask a Question section below this video. Uh, we will do our best to answer those questions uh, because the more questions we get, uh, the more fun we'll have. Uh, and it's always nice to answer the questions from uh, real people and everyone who is watching this live. Uh, these webinars are also best enjoyed with friends and colleagues. We still have a few spots left. Uh, if you're not super busy, just share the link. Uh, you, you can see it in your browser window, uh, tweet it or share it on Facebook or post it on LinkedIn and invite everyone you know to join us and participate in this webinar. All right, Vova, over to you. How are you? Hi, everyone. I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks for such an excellent introduction. First of all, I want to congratulate all the ladies in the room with the International Day of the Girl. <laughs> Coincidentally, we have a very uh, gender biased title today, One Man Translation Agency. Pardon us, in, in the Russian language, we don't, do not have such political correctness issues, but uh, I do apologize for putting it that way. Of course, we are talking about running a one person agency business. I've been translating for 16 years already, um, from English to Russian and Russian to English man, mainly. And Recently, maybe for one year or so, I have started taking on jobs in language pairs other than my own and handling it pretty successfully. Uh, as Dimitri said, almost a third of my income comes from actually managed projects in other language pairs. And I enjoy doing it very much. How did you start? That's basically it. How did you start taking jobs in other language pairs than? your working language pairs. How did that idea come to you? Yeah, actually, I think any translator who works for a while, every now and then you get some request from a client who says, hey, can you recommend someone in, in that pair or in this pair? And what people usually do, they go over to Facebook or some forum or whatever, and they put, a, put up a call and say, send your CVs over this email or that email. So I decided, but actually, it would benefit everyone if I take on this part, mm -hmm. take on this job. And if I help the client find proper translators, good translators in, in those pairs, because for the clients, it's usually a dark area. Mm -hmm. They can hardly decide which translator is good or bad. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, 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 that's and so, one yeah, of the it's, problems, it's, I guess, because how can you uh, ensure the quality in target language if you don't know the language? How can you be sure that translators that you're finding for your client are actually a good translators? Well, um, there are several factors, let's say. So I usually like to think of it as a funnel, you know, a funnel, a funnel. I think it's called funnel. Uh, you do not measure the quality right away because a good translator is not only a translator who can translate well. There are a lot of other factors such as being on time, uh, being communicative, being able to understand instructions. Perhaps the best first step to see out people who you uh, prefer not to work with is to see if they do not follow the instructions you post in whatever call you make. So if you tell them send your uh, CVs over here and instead they start putting them in the commands mm-hmm. field or something, it means they, they are already not following the instructions and if there are some instructions in the project itself, they are more likely not to follow them. Of course, it's not a rule. There are a lot of great translators who somehow miss this, but for a customer, for the for a project manager, it's important to manage risks. You cannot avoid all the risks, but what you can do is to use, is use practices that would mitigate them and make them as low as mm-hmm. possible. So the first step is like this, uh, seeing if they follow the instructions. And the second one for me personally is how well, how easy going, <laughs> easy goingly, it's not an, an adverb in English, but anyway, uh, they communicate. Because during the translation, all communications happen, all kinds of communications. You discuss terms, you discuss, I don't know, some background about the project. And if the person, if you do not feel comfortable communicating with that person, that's gonna be a drag. Mm -hmm. That's why in the very beginning you see when, even you send out a call and someone replies to you and you can see by their language that they actually can communicate well in the, at least in English, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, not at least in English, because probably they will be translating from English. But anyway, if they can can communicate in English, it means that you are not going to have problems with explaining something to them. Yeah, and I think that's the second step. After all, of course, there is also their social activity. Uh, Look at this as well, because a lot can be seen from, not only from how often a person writes to social media, but what they write what opinions they have. If they post every day in the TTNS group on Facebook saying that all customers are bad false, you know, that's why I probably don't want to uh, have this risk. <laughs> um, uh, that's it, but of course, in the end, you get some shortlists and you have to know who of them are actually, can actually translate. Mm-hmm. And here, the, it's not actually a trick, not a hack. You just have to, um, Try using two translators, one one as as a translator, the second one as a proofreader. And you you need to try to persuade, to convince the client that it makes sense to have it, to have a proofreader. And after a few projects, when you um, shuffle people, for instance, in the first project, translator A translates, translator B proofreads. In the next project, you... Um, switch change them in the third project you switch them <laughs> not change them in the third project you add someone else and in the end you can pretty reliably see how many edits are introduced and you ask after the translation if uh, you ask the proofreader what's their general opinion mm-hmm. because in major in the majority of cases i can judge for the english to russian translation i guess 50 percent of translation are pure garbage you know uh, I don't know if it's the same for all language pairs, but somehow um, they just don't miss the, they just miss the whole point of what translation is. And that's at least something you can get as a feedback from the proofreader, unless they are themselves someone who does this kind of job. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, <laughs> but that's very... where this, uh, you know, they say that a chair that stands on three feet cannot fall. Mm. That's somehow like this here. If you have three opinions, it usually works. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are also client feedback, but they don't always know if it's good or bad, but that's generally how I approach this. Of course, you know that on SmartCat, we also had this, uh, a whole endeavor based around this on selecting senior translators based on people reviewing each other's work. 
And that's how we got a lot of people, like dozens of people who have undergone this kind of testing. And I can already expect them to be uh, good at translating. Mm -hmm. And that's information, it inf this information, it's open, it's transparent, it's not kind of uh, asset that I keep secretly. Uh, all the translators I work with, I can easily share their names with anyone and uh, not asking anything in return. Mm -hmm. If uh, if they ask me to manage a project that's another story, then I will of course charge for this for this service. Mm -hmm. Let me go back uh, a bit to what you've just said uh, about persuading the client uh, to hire a proofreader. How can you do it? What arguments can you put forward so that the client who doesn't really understand the process of translation and how it all works would see the value in that? Well, I usually say that you have around 30% on top as the price mm -hmm. and you get twice less risk to have some kind of bug or flaw mm -hmm. because even the best translator, no one is insured against against doing the occasional um, slip of the finger <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and uh, having another person see it, it reduces it not two times, but I guess even even more. And more when two people communicate, the quality gets uh, much better. It's synergy, you know. Uh, just recently we had a project with Faustina. I guess Faustina is now in the audience. Faustina Dongu and Christina Kalin. We were translating from English to Italian and they had su such a great team together. They discussed all the kinds of things we were translating, you know. Um, one of the things were this Fixies cartoon, which you mm -hmm. might know in Russian. And there was also this Kikoriki cartoon, um, which in Russian goes as Smeshariki. Mm -hmm. We were translating them from English to Italian and they were brainstorming all the way. They were coming up with some ingenious, brilliant ways to translate some things. And uh, you, when you translate alone, you are somehow deprived of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's okay, but I don't usually see a lot of um, opposition from the client because if they are willing to pay, I don't know, 10 cents per word plus all the commissions plus my service fee and a smart cat commission, they are most likely willing to pay a bit on top to be sure. Of course, it's not always needed. If I'm translating some API manuals, I will not uh, try to convince them to, to hire a proofreader mm -hmm. for this. So Unless Lua, they want uh, to. At your opinion, at what stage of running your business as translator uh, can you consider becoming a one-man agency or one-woman agency? Is there a specific experience you need to have before you can venture into this whole uh, new world of running your own agency? Well, in my uh, world view, because there are different ones, it's when you have enough clients who trust you. And generally speaking, trust is the hardest currency in our business. It's something you cannot buy for money. It's something you can only get from experience. Once you have that trust with your clients, you can put this idea forward. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't even take a long to put this trust. I mean, uh, for example, I had a client who uh, had been working like two months with me and then they asked me if they have, if I know someone who would translate from English to Italian, I'm referring to this very project. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, sure. And I even can manage this. Um, and that's how it was. So as long as you feel confident translating in your own pair and talking to the client in your own pair, as long as you have direct clients, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, I think you are good to go. It takes, of course, some kind of, um, perspective on the world, being willing to communicate with people, being willing to connect people between among each other, between each other, mm -hmm. when you can do this. So you need to have at least some basic project management skills and organizational skills, because well, a lot of translators, yeah. they just, they just want to translate and they, they don't really like being involved in communicating between several people. You have to connect with the client, with translators, you have to organize workflows, you have to organize translation process, communication process, and it's, that's quite a complex. 
Well, uh, speaking yeah of project management, being honest. Yeah, first of all, I suck at project management. <laughs> um, I didn't study it, and um, <laughs> I constantly run into some things that I'm just having too much things in my hands, and I'm starting to lose it. Um, I'm trying to handle this, of course. But yeah, that's one of the things uh, why uh, being a translator, being a project manager is not the same as being a translator. On the other hand, project manager, in a way, it's a translator between the customer and the translator. Mm. So it's a meta level. Because customers and translators speak different languages. And uh, not terminology, mm -hmm. but they speak from a different motivation, yeah. yeah, perspective. And when a client asks a question, then sometimes want to hear one kind of answer and if they ask it directly to the translator, translator asks a whole different answers, a whole different mm -hmm. question because they just understand it differently. And I think a translator already has a skill inside that is meant to translate from something to some other thing. <laughs> yeah. If you just find the um, something inside you, sorry, I'm saying too much of some things in this <laughs> speech, but what I mean is that if you can tune yourself to reconfigure this mechanism inside to translate from the customer's language to the translator's language, it actually becomes a job that is much alike translation. Mm -hmm. A customer <laughs> asks you something and you think, well, okay, how I better put it to my translators so that they get it exactly the same way that the customer meant it. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about because I sometimes have to, well, it's rather interpreting than translation, but I sometimes have to interpret from Russian to Russian between my friends or between, I don't know, my husband yeah. and my grandparents. So I know what you're talking about. So you have to pick up that uh, the customer's language, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and vice versa mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Customers do not understand translators and translators do not always understand customers. Groups such as trans things translators never say are a di direct consequence of this fact. Mm -hmm. uh, almost 90% of the yeah. posts I see in this group, I want to say, guys, you completely missed the point here <laughs> what the client wanted. And if you just ask them in some way, you would, you would have understood that there was no uh, Offense, universal conspiracy against you mm -hmm. or against us translators. It's just a matter of huge miscommunication, misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Well, in all fairness, uh, I think this group is awesome. <laughs> and Eric is yeah, doing a great job of managing it. And I think I think the the vast majority of posts, uh, <laughs> I hope the, mass, the vast majority of posts were just made up for this of uh, game or race really? <laughs> or something. I, I don't think so, actually. I, I hope so. I'm not sure. I mean, I hope that the people are just posting uh, just to entertain each other and to support each other. And because if if the hundred percent of those stories are true, then we actually yeah we do have a communication <laughs> problem with, with with some with some really bad customer experience. Yeah, but well, we need to vent out sometimes. You know, that's why. Yeah, of course, and uh, that's a great place to do that. Room for rent, you know, and get some support. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you you run your uh, one person uh, agency, and of course you have to market somehow. Market it somehow. Uh, how do you market your business? Uh, and do you need to invest into digital marketing like uh, SEO, AdWords, etc.? This is actually a question from Zentara Kenzo. Uh, hopefully, I didn't butcher your name. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, Zandra's real name is Marisa. Uh, I think it's some kind of allies. But anyway, uh, by the way, Marisa, hi. Um, for me, I do not invest anything in social media management or something. Um, I'm planning, we are planning actually, we are a group of 10 people, 10 translators who, who have been working with each other for quite a while in different pairs. We plan to start kind of an agency with a website. Um, and it's funny because Simon Akramev had recently the same idea. You might have followed his SFT group where he uh, also gathered like 10 people in other in different language pairs and he gave the rights to manage the website in specific language pairs to them. So, and it's fine that it's 
two ways to approach the same problem. First is when you have a website and you get all inbound marketing, yes? Mine is the direct opposite way. I get all my clients from not that what not was inbound marketing and I get all my I approach people if I see that their website translation sucks or if I get an ad on Facebook that I see has lousy translation to English or to Russian or whatever. Are you still mm -hmm. with me guys? Because yeah, we are. okay. Yeah. I can talk to you avatars. No problem. So, <laughs> um, and I just write to them saying, guys, your landing page sucks. How do you expect anyone to take you seriously? If you have such a translation, finally, it usually comes out that they have paid as much as 15 cents per word on some online translation platform to, to get this. So, uh, I, even with all the commissions involved with my own service fee involved can ensure for a lower price a much better quality because first I will be working with people I trust and second I will not be taking like 40% of or 50% of, of the money for some managing the platform or whatever. So mm -hmm. in my case it's purely uh, word of mouth because I have a lot of clients recommend me to their business partners and so on and direct marketing. Mm -hmm. And how do you position uh, may ask? Okay, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry for interrupting you, Elena. Uh, I, I was wondering if you work in a specific niche uh, or do you target clients from a specific niche or how do you approach? Yeah, yeah, uh, I have a specific niche, but it's uh, on one hand, it's hard to define. It's, Companies who want to go global. It's a very broad definition, but if you think of it, it rules out a lot of uh, things that it does not apply to. For instance, translating technical manuals, translating birth certificates, this kind of thing. So it's specifically aimed at companies who decided either they're an English speaking company, an American company that wants to expand globally, or it's vice versa, a Russian or Spanish or, I don't know, Arabic company who wants to have a, an English website, first of all. And in many cases, it starts with a company who wants to go from Russian to English, and then they want to expand from this English to other languages. And uh, here I have a lot of hacks, tips, tricks on how to best tackle uh, this kind of, not this kind of clients, but how to best help this kind of clients. What are some okay. of those tips? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Uh, for instance, uh, these people, uh, in these cases, you want to know what the goal of the exact text is. If it's a landing yeah. page, you want to know how well it converts. And if a Russian company comes to you with a text that is written in pure bureaucraties with words, 12, 20 words, uh, 20 characters long and a lot of water, as we say in Russian, that doesn't mean anything. You just say to them, filler, guys, filler this fill yeah, filler if, if filler, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes it thinks that uh, filler is more there than anything else. It's funny when, you know, when a client comes with a 500 word landing page and I give them back an English page that 100 words long mm -hmm. and <laughs> with all the same meaning, um, it also helps to be able to tell stories because any landing page or whatever, any page that is meant to convert must tell a story. It must have a beginning, it must have a culmination, it must have an ending. So that's basically my specifics, I guess. So it, it, it sounds to me that uh, your clients, uh, all of your clients are not just interested in translation, but something more like a mix of transcreation and copywriting. Uh, I I know the words transcreation and copywriting. I try not to use them. <laughs> when we say transcreation, although I have nothing against transcreation, people uh, understand it as something like, you know, translate, I'm loving it, or translate, just do it. Like mm -hmm. when people are spending two days in a marketing team trying to think of a Russian slogan for just do it. Uh, that's what comes to my mind when I say transcreation. In this case, yeah, you can say transcreation, but in the end, 
the translator must always know what the goal and the audience of their text is, even if you are translating not this kind of documents, but anyway, if you if you are translating a technical manual and you see that it's written in a lousy text that is not understandable, then you will go to the customer and say that you need to rewrite this, right? You will not just, I think that's also a difference between the 90 percentile and the 50 percentile, because the 50 percentile, they will just translate it and leave their lives on. But if you want to keep the relationship with this customer, you must always give them a bit more than they expect. Mm. And this will give them the wow effect, you know. Mm. Uh, do you ask your clients to fill out some sort of a brief uh, so that uh, your translators could have, could have a better idea uh, what they're translating about, like additional context, who's the target audience, what kind of style they're looking for, etc. Yeah, uh, that's one of those those things that uh, where this translating abilities from customer language to translator language helps because customers hate such questions. They want you, they want to give you something, and they want something back. Of course, mm -hmm. there are situations when you cannot avoid asking them. But if you are if you start asking them questions, them questions that you could somehow find your own answers to they uh, would be bored or bothered or annoyed. So in most cases, I try to come up with a kind of briefing myself. So once I get an assignment, I try to understand what the audience is, what our goal is, and so on. And then, of course, uh, tell this to the translators. Mm -hmm. We have a great question from Paige, who is watching us now. Uh, it, I really like this question because that was something I thought about myself when you were <laughs> saying <laughs> how you get clients. So Paige, uh, Paige is asking, how do you get business by pointing out a cyclically translated website without alienating the client? I find it hard not to be blunt. And that well, was something um, that I tried doing myself, but I never succeeded. So I must be doing something wrong. What's your approach? First of all, it must be uh, down to the point. It not, must not just say your website sucks uh, mm. or the from me. You must give something right away. You make a screenshot of the front page in any tool. Just in paint, you write on top, like here you shouldn't have double T. Here you should have another world. Here you said that uh, that you want to sell bottles when actually you want to sell milk. I don't know any, anything. Mm. Um, you give them a result right away that they can use. You do not ask anything in return for this. And of course, you should not uh, use personal appeals. Uh, like you say that the translation is bad and that's a fact. And you can, if you want to sweeten this appeal, you can say that the the text in the original language is so great, but the translation is not. It's not always the case. It's better not to lie because sometimes both the source language and the target language <laughs> suck. But I, did, I, I didn't think I would use the word suck so much today. Sorry. I don't know other <laughs> synonyms for this in English. I'm sorry. Leave much to be desired. Yeah. Yes, uh, exactly. The, <laughs> the kind of other language that I'm trying to get rid of. <laughs> In all the copies I, I, I'm editing. Yeah, and, but you know, this can, this experience can suck in another way sometimes. <laughs> Will you beep this out in the recording, I wonder? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a vulgar word, is it? Is it? If anything, we are rushing, come on. I think it's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's colloquial, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one, um, yeah, Paige, sorry. Okay, I will use some <laughs> different one. Leave much to be desired. So uh, what <laughs> I meant to say that this experience leaves much to be desired in another way because once I did exactly the same and the next thing I knew is that the customer fired their translator. And hmm. said it was some young girl that I just graduated from some university and they fired it, the, it sorry, fired her right away uh, after receiving this email and mm -hmm. well i felt i was about to say a word that's much worse than uh, the previous one i i didn't feel the best way mm. and i'm still not over it 
but in the mm. end, maybe it will be a lesson for her, for them. I don't know. Maybe she will yeah. become better. So uh, you might have have heard the story about a book translated into Russian about some association football coach, and it was translated so bad it was publicized in some blog online. So. Um, the whole book, the whole issue was then recalled mm -hmm. and uh, the translator was fired, of course. I tried finding her profile, I found it and I also felt sorry for her, but and then, well, it's business after all. And a good guy is not a job, as they say. Yeah. 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 And also, bad translators can be great at something else. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a good wake-up call to know that you should be doing something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, a question for you, Wawa. How do you position yourself on the market? Because you mentioned that uh, you work with mostly companies who are looking to expand their businesses and go global. So, do you position yourself as an agency, as a corporate entity, or more of a, a freelancer offering some value-added services and what are the advantages and disadvantages of both approaches what do you think well of course the advantage of being an agency is that you sound cool and hey you're an agency you're a company uh, i cannot afford this because i don't even have a website you cannot say i'm an agency but i don't mm. have a website it just won't work what i usually do is i say that i have a team that i work with and that I can manage this team for your projects for a certain percentage of mm -hmm. the value, which is usually much, um, much more, not much more affordable, much more affordable than what they would get from an agency with all its value added services. And uh, it would also be much more transparent. And if a client is to manage the, this, the same kinds of things themselves, they would spend much more time and get much more headache from this than using my service. Uh, that's it. Because uh, coming back to why translators make great project managers, because most of the questions we have to discuss with the translators when I manage a project is some terminology issues and so on. And even if it's a language I don't understand, we were translating to Japanese, to German. If German, I can at least read in Japanese, I cannot even understand. Mm -hmm. I know only one character that looks like a smiley face, but that doesn't help much. Um, <laughs> so all, uh, still, sometimes translators come up with questions. I'm like, I'm trying to choose between this and this, and I cannot understand what better fits here. And the, your lingu linguistic knowledge as a translator helps here, because what a usual project manager at an agency would do, they will say, okay, wait a moment, I'll ask the client and come back with an answer. Mm -hmm. Then they would probably ask the client and the client would have no idea because, hey, linguistics, are you kidding me? So, and then this question will be just buried under the blankets and uh, come up in a sub suboptimal translation. If a translator manages the project, it's also brainstorming, it's also sharing expertise and know-how, and it helps a lot. But what was the question again? How do you, How position, do you position yourself on the yeah, market? So basically, I position myself as a freelance project manager, I guess you can say so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any advantages uh, of positioning yourself in that way? So does it probably evoke more trust from clients because you work all with the clients that uh, you already know. Yeah, I think I think they identify the service with myself anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, just as the translators identify the order with with me, although it comes from a company. I'm I'm yet to face a situation when my customer runs away with the money and I have to uh, to mortgage my house to pay the debts. But <laughs> for the time being, it's going pretty well, and. Uh, the advantage is that I can show them that it is the best offer they can get because mm. the whole pricing is very transparent. Uh, for instance, in my case, uh, if I pay, if they pay 10 cents to the translator, they pay one cent to me and one cent to SmartCat because we are doing all this via SmartCat and that's it. Mm -hmm. so basically for just 20% of the price, actually less because of the mathematical tricks involved, 
you get the same level of quality as you would get when you're ordering from an agency for 16 or 17 cents mm -hmm. per word. And here's where market comes in. And as I said, mm -hmm. most clients find this um, percentage very reasonable. I'm yet to find out actually if it's reasonable for me, but I'm not complaining. Um, especially when you have a trusted team of translators, there might be some um, issues in the beginning when you are just like a new car, you're trying to, I don't know the word in it for it in English. So you have to spend some mileage before all the gears work together well. But after this, mm -hmm. it's basically just, uh, imagine if you have to translate to 10 languages, which, which is not unexpected these days. And it means that if you then take percent, then you get the price of a whole translation for just managing a project of translation to these 10 languages. And mm -hmm. it's actually, yeah. it looks like a business for me, but at the same time, I can see exactly uh, where my service price is. And the client can see this, the translator can see this. Mm -hmm. I think um, our industry suffers a lot from this air of secrecy that surrounds everything. That agencies don't want to share their translators, uh, that if a question is asked, the agency will not bring the translator in touch with the customer, but will somehow try to um, be the middleman. Come on, guys, it's 21st century. You cannot, you cannot prevent people from finding each other if they are really <laughs> up to. I mean, you're spending so much of your, of your time and of your money, which you could pay to the translators in the end by increasing their rates just for, the, mm -hmm. for keeping this secrecy i think it's i think it's just weird and Stupid. unexplainable yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, when your end clients they they come to you uh, do you already know though what kind of rates you're going to offer them yeah uh, i try sticking to uh, the same rates everywhere again this is a part of customer mindset they do not want you to look at a translation say okay here's it's 11 cents here it's eight cents they like it in a expectable for a customable way you know um, of course there are some translations that are harder than others but in the end it's also risk management it's also knowing your expectations um, my usual breakdown is that the translator gets 10 cents per word the proofreader if any gets 3.5 cents per word i get 1.5 cents per word and smart cat gets 1.5 cents per word in the end it's around 15 16 cents but it's for a work with a translator and the proofreader and in most cases the translator and proofreader know each other for instance we've been working working on uh, on a project for exola which is a gaming platform or something mm -hmm. and uh, we were translating it to german japanese korean uh, chinese and i had we had these pairs of people like philip and adrian for german emma and miho for japanese andrew and richard for korean yuji and guoli for chinese they were in skype with each other they could discuss things so it also helped a lot yeah, it does help a lot when the translator and proofreader um, can communicate with each other. I know an agency who not only prevents uh, translators from communication, from direct communication with client, but at some point they decided that they don't want uh, their translators and proofreaders communicate with each other. And that is something that I can't understand at all. <laughs> because doesn't make any sense what 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 harm can it do people <laughs> yeah um, well they may start an agency and throw you away oh. you know um, i think i was going to say something i forgot it but i think yeah this air of secrecy it definitely hurts everyone uh, ah yeah i they wanted would... to say a kind of a know-how it might be my invention might be not usually <laughs> when you have a translator and a proofreader you make the proofreader the one in charge so the translator translates then the proofreader corrects it and it's the final word something like this in our project it's usually vice versa so uh, we have mm -hmm. the core team of translators 
which I know I know are good. So they translate, then proofreader makes some corrections, and in the end, translators looks at all the corrections, and if they don't agree them, they revert back. So it's up to the translator to decide how they want it to be. Because uh, also some of the things from the TTNS group is that proofreaders are awful and so on. Uh, in this case, proofreaders are more like the second pair of eyes that will help you avoid typos, avoid embarrassment and so on. Find some better ways to explain some things. And as far as I know, at least as far as the translators tell me, they are, they are happy with this approach. It's so, a great approach, but I know it so it's Unfortunately, it's not your invention. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I think I think it's great. Yeah, in in some cases, uh, the I, I sometimes when I, that's the basically the same agency. They also use that approach, and sometimes the translation is so bad that I have to tell the project management that you probably would be better off using my version. But in the majority of cases, <laughs> it's, all, it's always best when the translator uh, can have a look or the final say. And it also helps, uh, I don't know, I, I, thought, I thought that uh, I have several agencies that use the same approach, so I thought it was widely spread. Uh, and it really makes sense because it also helps the translators to improve. So not all proofreaders are bad. I usually have great proofreaders and looking, just looking at those suggestions, helps me improve uh, my translations. Absolutely, yeah. So it's re it really yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Well, have you ever had translators taking offense uh, about the, the proof proofreading done by other proofreaders or they are always happy with the work? No, proofreader? they were not always happy, but not taking <laughs> offense, I hope. I had, uh, sometimes I had uh, the main, uh, for instance, Yuji, our main Chinese translator, she was away and I had to hire a person that I was working with for the first time. And when Yuji came back and she edited the text, she said that the translation wasn't, wasn't good. Um, in this mm. case, I just take note and go further, knowing that I will not work with uh, these guys again. Mm. But anyway, um, I think I keep forgetting what I was going to say, but anyway, let's go on. I might remember it. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, some questions from our viewers. Una asks, any tips or suggestions on how, on how to deal with or avoid unreliable service providers? Uh, it means translators. You have uh, in partly answered that question earlier. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, you try, try building a team that you work with. You try finding their, uh, what they are like as people because usually you can see an, unre an unreliable contractor um, from an early point, I think so. Mm -hmm. So for you, yeah. it, it means it's all about communication. Uh, yeah, people have to be responsible. All about, yeah. People have to be responsible. They have to uh, reply to your emails as soon as they get them. No, not really as soon as they get them because anyone can have a time off it's not it's not enough <laughs> but yeah sometimes what i hate most and cannot understand totally is when a person accepts a job by the deadline and the job is not there by the deadline and they do not come back to you with any kind of commentary because mm. one thing that even you as a project manager cannot handle is babysitting every translator and asking them every two hours if uh, the translation is going to be there. Okay, well, I, we are doing this on SmartKit, so I can basically see in real time how far they are along. But if there are many projects, and I told you that I'm left much to be desired at project management, sometimes I'm mis miscontrolling this. So yeah, sometimes it happens. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting you mentioned that uh, about babysitting uh, your translators. Uh, we recently had a conversation uh, with a group of translators I work with at localization companies. And the project manager asks us to share our feedback, uh, uh, what the, our ideal project manager should look like. And one of the top, top comments was, please do not harass me, let me do my work. <laughs> yeah. I, th I, th I think it shows that uh, there are a lot of people in this who somehow end up working in this profession who don't actually have the necessary skills.
their business skills, necessarily community. And that creates the problems for people who work in the project management because it's really hard reliable to know uh, translators who know what they're doing, who know their craft, and who are who are going to deliver the project 100% on time every single time. So I think this is uh, a difficult situation to tackle in our industry, and I hope it's going to improve in the future. Yeah, um, I think the names matter a lot. So if you have a team with names, uh, people who stand for their names, it helps. When mm -hmm. a client comes to an agency, the translator might in the end think, okay, no one is anyway going to know that it's 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 me, so whatever. But uh, I always try to to let the world know who these translators are, that they are awesome, and so on. And it pays back. I have heard on more than one occasion when people told me, hey, Vova, are you going to have any work during the next week? Because I have a pending request, but I will reject it if you tell me that you are going to have anything. As I said, mm -hmm. trust is the hardest currency here. Yeah. So I guess as a project manager, you have to manage your risk. Uh, you have to try something, and if it doesn't work out, you can always find another translator. Uh, yeah. If it were that easy, actually, yeah, it's one of the hardest things in project management when suddenly you have a situation when you cannot deliver on time. A translator lets you down, but you have to deliver somehow, and you are embarrassed before the client. Because, of course, they blame you, and rightfully so. Um, you should have managed it better, and they do not care if it was someone else's fault. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. one of the most challenging things in being a project manager. After you have having to mortgage your situation? house. Oh, I had, <laughs> I had a couple, yeah. I had a couple. Well, usually I did find some translator, some other translator in time, um, because... Uh, commercial here we have this market marketplace and I could yeah. pretty quickly find someone and look through their profiles and uh, I tried to have at least three four people in each language pair that I can kind of trust because there is yeah. one core member one uh, proofreader who are more or less constant who you trust totally and then there are people who okay they made not the best translation but at least they were responsive and Sometimes it's yeah, about it's not perfectionism, but getting things done. Uh, yeah. I have a question about choosing translators. It's, a, it's very interesting. To, uh, it's interesting to know how people who run their agencies approach the selection process and how they, they select translators they want to work with. Uh, so uh, one of the questions often discussed is that uh, you got to have online visibility. You got to be active on social media. You got to show show up uh, everywhere, you, you got to have a blog, you got to communicate with people, network. That when you choose translators, does the online visibility affect your choice of whether you're going to work with this person or not? I think it's one of the factors and one of the ways for a translator to build this, let's call it pre-trust. But there are other ways. Mm. Actually, even if you have a profile uh, of a translator, and you have a copy that where they say, okay, I'm this and that. And usually even in these several sentences, you can see um, the soul behind the person who writes it, unless they just copy paste it in from somewhere, which is of course another story. Uh, people who uh, just write, I'm an experienced translator with uh, this and that and that, they're better off having some online visibility because this is what everyone writes and you are not going to stand out by just putting this in your profile. But mm -hmm. um, if your profile is really, I don't know, some, sometimes you see a profile and it really blows your mind, even if it's not the best. Uh, I was hiring someone from Russian to, from Japanese to Russian, I think, and there was this girl just graduated from the university and she said, I have no experience, but bear with me or something like this it sounded bad in russian and i think it was the, the best <laughs> sorry guys who do not speak russian yeah it was the best tagline in ub translators and uh, i'm willing to work with her when when i had the chance. Yeah. because you can see that the person yeah. is creative i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah 
that, that, that oh. is a great phrase, yeah. <laughs> the real question is, was she any good? Uh, I didn't get to work with her, actually, because she okay. was away. She is now preparing mm. uh, for some Olympic volunteering thingy or something. Nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have another question from Engine. Uh, what kind of legal form you need to, to have uh, in order to be this one person agency? Do your clients make the payment to you or to the translator and your viewer separately? Yeah, here it will be the most commercial heavy part of this webinar because <laughs> the, the only thing that lets me do the whole thing is smart cap because uh, the customer they just pay once to smart cap and then all the payments are distributed between every freelancer, including myself. What I usually do, because the customers, they of course do not want to know some smart cat where they have to do something. So I just create accounts for them with their permission, of course. And I just manage their accounts on smart cat. I send out jobs, I track the payments, then I create an invoice or something. I send it to them, they pay, they can have an illegal agreement with smart cat. So Every, every legal obstacle is covered by this. Of course, if, if not for this, I wouldn't be able to do this at, like, at all. Because you know, um, sometimes people say that market is not convenient here and there, and I can say yes, some, it is in some ways, but it is not a question of whether it is convenient to do or not convenient. It's a question of whether you can do this in principle or not. And market is the only thing that I know in the world that allows to do such things. I actually run a whole business without, I have an individual entrepreneurship start, status in Russia, but then, then that's it. Mm -hmm. What is the sort of reference what our prime minister Medvedev said, Dmitry, I'm wondering. Well, you, you said- Денег нет, но вы держитесь. Yeah, no money, but hang in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that was what he said when he was appointed the prime minister? No, no it was something he said while he was visiting Crimea. Yeah, he oh, was visiting Crimea. About a year ago. Maybe oh, yeah. even two years ago. And it's kind of turned into meme. So uh, that girl who yeah. uh, she, she sent, sent that message, she was kind of used as, kind of like as a reference. I didn't know, yeah. <laughs> similar, similar wording. <laughs> no. That's, that, then that was a matter of copy and pasting. Yeah. No, I think that was a matter of a high creativity, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> high degree of creativity to take something and use it in a different context. That, that was the reason I liked it. <laughs> 50 um, points for good meme knowledge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next question comes from David. He asks, uh, and it, his question is actually connected with something you said before. Have you ever thought that uh, language service providers you work for may see you as, a com as competition? Do you think this can play against you when looking for new language service providers or maintaining your current customers? To be honest, I work, um, I almost do not work with uh, LSP. But I do have one LSP I work with. I don't know if Yuri is in the audience now. Yuri Chigarov, he manages um, the Harmony IT agency in Kazan. One of the few agencies that charge real money to clients and not, you know, like peanuts. Yeah. Uh, so they can afford a high level of quality. And we actually, it's, this model is interesting even if I have LSPs uh, who approach me for some kind of project. For instance, we were talking about some cryptocurrency related project. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, totally, you, we can use the same model even with an LSP because it's, come on, it's 10% mm -hmm. of the price. It's somehow it's, it can even be lost in the books, but it's not. So I think even with proper LSPs, not the ones, you know, who just, I don't know actually what these guys are doing, charging, 10 cents to the client and paying three cents to the translator, it just doesn't sit in my mind well. Hmm. Oh, yeah. An interesting it thing is what, that... It is what happens. <laughs> it happens quite a lot. It's it's very, just, I think it's just a diff, different market, different segment market. Maybe it's bigger, uh, maybe it's more dynamic, maybe companies open yeah. and close all the time, but... I, I don't want to work there. I don't want to go there. Market is a tricky topic. I do believe in market, but sometimes people take markets too literally, like there is only 
supply and demand and that's it like trust has no market value but it does as i already mm. explained and yeah. uh, you know um, it's very tempting when you do not have transparency and you have hundreds of translators available to two cents for two cents per word why would you pay them 10 cents per word but i do i mean in Seoul we had projects to czech and to slovak where almost the whole marketplace is filled with uh, rates at two and three cents per word but whatever these guys also get 10 cents per word from from the customers i manage projects for because I think that a translator should get the same amount regardless of what language pair they work in. Okay, maybe if they work in some very rare language pair, they can charge 30 cents per word. I heard this story on Facebook about some, uh, I don't know, do you remember maybe it was some British dialect that gets paid like the most expensive dialect in the world. But in mm -hmm. other cases, I don't think that even if the market says two cents per word, then you should pay two cents per word. Maybe it's because I know what kind of translation you get from the majority of people who charge two cents per word in Russia. It doesn't mean that's, they are all that's, necessarily that's the bad. Problem. You, you know that the end clients doesn't know that. They, they have no, no idea. It's, it's easy to explain. You just show them an example of what uh, these translators do. It, it even must not be a bad translator. They may be able to yeah. translate well, but well, when you have two cents per word, all you can do is edit mesh and translation, avoid grammatical mistakes and factual incorrectnesses and go further. That's all you can afford. You cannot afford to have yeah. a revision. Okay, maybe spell checking, but then that's it. And so um, when a person who charges usually two cents per word and they get a job for 10 cents per word, they will put everything they can into it and give a great, great translation, I think what everyone can understand yeah. hopefully <laughs> yeah and uh, also when when someone work is working for two cents per word they just have to work a lot like really all all of their time and then they just don't have any time it, it's just it's just uh when working for such um uh, yeah peanuts you just can't uh, afford, as you say, to pay a lot of attention to quality because you just have to earn your living. And yeah. Yeah, I've been there the first few years. I was translating for um, like one ruble per word. What would that be? Less than one cent, mm. maybe one and something cent per word. I, I took it as kind of challenge to translate more and more uh, to reach 1,000 and a half thousand 100 and a half words per hour and i reached that milestone you can imagine <laughs> what the result was well it was like it was grammatically coherent but it was just russian text written in english words uh, it's like you know when people lay asphalt bitumen the work is hidden so uh, it's the most usual uh, thing where money are stolen when people do roads because no one can see what's beneath this asphalt it's the same here no one the client will not see sometimes that there's actually nothing beneath the one millimeter at the top, no solid ground under it. So mm -hmm. Louis Ben Kosen, sorry, uh, he writes that uh, in his country, no one will pay 10 cents per word or more. That's totally irrelevant to the way projects really should be managed. It doesn't depend on the country. I don't care if I translate to French, if the person comes from Switzerland or from, uh, Burkina Faso, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think we, that one advantage of our global world is that it doesn't really matter where you live. Uh, the main thing is that you have good internet connection and then you can work with companies from all over the world. Yeah. Uh, we have, I think, one last question from mm -hmm. uh, Panas, uh, I think it was uh, he was referring to the business model that uh, you are using. How would that model work for interpreting? Well, I think the model is pretty generic for interpreting or for design work or for whatever. Uh, you just build a trusted team. You go to existing clients saying that you can deliver this. Okay, for interpreting, you need physical presence, most likely. So it's hard to work in 20 language pairs as an interpreter. Or maybe it's hard to find clients who need uh, to interpret into 20 languages. Mm. But the general formula, I think it would be the same. Trust, personal relations, communication. That's it. Yeah. 
we have a comment from Paige who's saying regarding the prices issue, it's always the hottest topic <laughs> in any conversation. But if it's a person can topic. make a living yeah, in their country for two cents per word, shouldn't they be allowed to do that? Um, what do you think? Paul? Yeah, I, I thought about this a lot. Um, and I think that the market works this way, that some locations are generally more favorable than others. If a person mm -hmm. lives in India and they are a good translator, in a lot of cases, maybe not all cases, they will want to go to some other place because they're a good translator and they can get good feedback from the clients. They will naturally go upward and upward, going from Indian suburbs to Delhi, from Delhi to the US, I don't know. Of course, it's not a rule because a lot of people will go from the US to India to downgrade, but it's not something that affects the market. There are a lot of people who charge low rates and who do good translations, but they do not affect the market because one translator can only translate so many words per day and you cannot have them enough to be able to, um, to change the market. And if this person uh, can make a living in the country for two cents per word, I'm pretty sure they will not reject the idea of earning 10 cents per word and Oops. doing something good with the eight cents because if they are good, they deserve it more than other people who earn two cents per word. That's, it's that easy, I guess. Yeah, that's why yeah. we have this thing called globalization and we got to make it work for us and not the other way around. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's totally a good thing. I mean, uh, Dmitry, you're on the other uh, side of the spectrum. We are living in Canada when translating yes. games from English to Russian and charging 18. I don't know, maybe you already do 20 cents per word. It's, wow, I mean, way to go. Uh, well, that's my rates. My rates they 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 vary from twelve to eighteen cents per word. But of course, I try to get as as high as possible, especially when working with direct clients, because yeah, direct clients here, 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 is always, is always here in Canada or in the United States. I mean, clients they we have different uh, GDP, <laughs> different rates, different salaries, and charging Russian prices wouldn't make much more sense for me. <laughs> because I would be hurting myself and probably hurting uh, my uh, profession and my industry. Uh, so uh, that's why I, I, can, I completely agree with you that uh, if, you're, if you know your worth, if you know that you are good at what you do, uh, and uh, if you have great skills, so you should always aim, shoot for the stars, basically. If you were a bad translator, you would unlikely be able to afford moving to Canada and charging these 18 cents that you are charging, right? Well, uh, I do have my wife, and she's also working, so we come from yeah, a double, okay. <laughs> double income household, which is, which helps every yeah. now and then when I have a slow slow time. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that mechanic is generally we get generally by. We get by. <laughs> yeah. Somehow, I think that we that probably we shouldn't put it like that. Whether we should allow or we shouldn't allow someone to charge two cents per word if they're okay, okay with that. Well, why not? Uh, I think that I, I read it somewhere, I don't remember where, uh, but I think that uh, people who charge two cents per word are not basically a competition to those who want to charge 10 cents per word or 18 cents per word. And it's not because they, are, uh, they do a poor job. It's not because they, they translate worse than those who charge 18 cents per word. There are cases uh, when people... Uh, can be excellent translators, but bad marketeers or salespeople. And that's why they're charging their two cents per word, but they still do a good job in some, I think in some economies it's possible, in some markets it's possible to make a living charging two cents per word. Uh, but on the other hand, even if you live in a market where two cents per word is basically a good price, and I, I'm not sure what uh, Russian agencies are paying at the moment. I haven't worked for them, I think, for about 10 years now. But I think that two cents per word might be a price that's pretty average on the Russian market when if you work with Russian agencies. Uh, but charging more allows me to do things that I enjoy. For example, if I worked for two cents per word, I probably could make my ends meet. I might have even, uh, I, I might even have had more 
uh, work than I have now, but I would have to work more hours and I wouldn't be able to finish a book translation and be working on the second one, which doesn't pay much at the moment. So I think that charging uh, higher prices allows you to do more. But again, it's not for everyone and probably people would be better off charging two cents per word, having a lot of work and then having time for, I don't know, other hobbies or family or things like that. Like, so a, like I occasional it's... sleeping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I have time for that. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's completely true. But there's the average and the average mm. quality of translations to do it on the average of two cents per word is below average. That's it. So yeah, yeah. I cannot that's imagine true. a situation when the two cent per word translation would make a real competition to a 10 cent per word translation in statistical terms, you know, in not in, in terms, individual no. terms, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I that's agree. how market works. Otavio wrote that sometimes you move to countries with lower costs to live as a freelancer and it's beneficial. Yes. And that's also one of the ways the market works. And mm -hmm. what we see is a result of the market work, not of some conspiracy and the, in the end, we want to get a certain amount of awesomeness per hour, right? Not dollars, not, not words, or some other currency. And I think yeah. this is going up. As long as you provide good service, it will go up inevitably. Uh, I don't know, we have to finish maybe, but I want to say that, uh, speaking of rates, uh, why would I pay 10 cents per word for someone who charges 2 cents per word? Because it's opening a talent, opening up a talent. I had one or two cases when I got such a, an awesome translation for one and a half set per word that I wrote, come on, are you kidding me? You must charge like <laughs> five at least. And, and uh, okay, if you wish to, if you wish to get some client feedback first, that's fine. But just know that it doesn't cost one and a half cent per word. And that's one mm -hmm. of the ways I think we should help each other by, by educating when how good or bad our services really are because sometimes they are not sometimes they are yeah and i think that's another way uh, why translators might be uh, great project managers because i don't think any project manager working for a big agency would say something like that yeah. <laughs> to a translator i think so i think uh, actually the whole, this whole industry given the right tools which smart care is of course uh, this whole industry could be fed in its entirety by uh, small translation agencies, small teams, and it would not need these huge guys. I only can say that because we are not airing this on market, but on translators on air. But yeah, it's my personal opinion. We could totally make this industry rock. But it yeah. takes courage. It, it takes, takes action. going out of your comfort zone learning something new because if you want only to translate something that other people give you you will keep doing this and that's it yeah i guess it's a good point to wrap up our conversation it's been a pleasure talking to you and i i had a lot of fun i hope you guys learned a lot of uh useful and interesting things that will help you probably move your business and forward and become a one person agency translation agency thank you guys for joining us tonight uh, thank you for watching that in the recording if you did uh, don't forget to check out our sponsors website by clicking the green button below or checking out the first link in the description if you are watching the recording uh, or just go into smartcat.ai and we'll see you next week see you bye, bye, thanks everyone. guys bye thank you Ta -ta. bye <laughs>